This is a seaweed called Laminaria hyperborea. This particular video was taken uh, on the west coast of Norway, just where I live. As you can see, the plants appear vigorous. They appear almost energized. Uh, they are an important part of the life force of our seas. Unfortunately, their chemistry includes a chemical much sought after for today's food industry, alginate. To make harvesting of the seaweed for alginate extraction financially viable, the techniques that are used are so destructive that the only term can be used to describe them is ecocide. This is what the plants look are like after the trawlers have been through. They're not just crushed, they look as if they've been poisoned and the wildlife is destroyed as well. Norway wants the world to believe that it cares for nature, that it cares for wildlife and that it cares for the future. So why is it so concerned about the Amazon rainforest when its own rainforest is open for destruction? This is the front page of Norway's regulations for fishing uh, in the sea from the Fiskeri Delectoratet. It says the coast is yours. These are two seaweed trawlers scraping the bed in the sea outside Hustavika. They have been scraping the same area now, the same bay, for a year. Currently, there are three trawlers operating in there, full-time, every day. The trawlers tow a three-metre, that is, nearly ten-foot-wide, sled through the forest, ripping up the plants from the sea floor. We know it kills most of the animals and indeed a great number of the plants living in that area. The first map is from the Fiskeri Directorat, its home page, showing the area where there are strict four-year regulations on harvesting. The area above the regulated zones and up to the islands sticking out to sea, that is the Lofoten Islands, is unregulated currently. They just harvest as much as they can. We have figures that say that 20 square kilometres of this seaweed, that is Laminaria hyperborea, removes approximately 480 tonnes of nitrogen from the sea per year. The papers we read tell us that while the seaweed plants return, usually, not always, usually, the majority of the animals take between six and nine years to return. Thus, the Norwegian coast is systematically being emptied of life. Our little group is in contact with marine biologists and researchers all over the world. It has been proposed that the reason for the disappearance of the Norwegian seaweed forest is due to global warming. So we asked some marine biologists much further south. They assured us there was no problem with their seaweed forest and how deeply concerned they were with what is going on here and the effect it may have on their industry, which they feel is done sustainably. This is a fascinating report. It has many facts and figures. One which is very pertinent to us right at this moment is this one. Essentially, it says that um, if the harvesting zones um, that they currently use of 18 odd square kilometers um, were as they as the figures say they are then they would only need 87 square kilometers 
to harvest the 180,000, 90,000 tonnes of seaweed they do every year on a rotational basis. So why do they need the entire coast? It is eminently possible that the reason they need the entire coast is because of what that article says, that the seaweed after a while doesn't grow back and in some places it never grows back and in other places you get predators moving in and destroying it. This industry is an example of the most gross environmental vandalism committed by any civilised state in the world today. This industry is protected by the state against any environmental complications. Regulations and laws are changed to facilitate their industry. Laws that are made protecting the Norwegian people's rights. This includes the rights of businesses as well. They are being overridden. Here is a little article about Fylkesmanne who refused to take part in a work group on tar trawling because he felt it was too corrupt. They were not interested in the environment or what effect it is having on seabird. This is not isolated. There are many other articles. People are deeply upset over this. The question you might ask is how much information we have about this. We have laid a good deal out on our website, stoptt.com. This is a snip from the Tyler Touring Conference at Trondheim in 2013. This is a senior figure for the Fiskeri Directorate from Olesund, Terje Halstensen. He told us that the Tare Trawlers um, have exactly the same laws and regulations as all the other fishing boats on the Norwegian coast. This is simply not true. We pointed this out to him and he apologised, saying that he was actually quoting from an earlier law. Now, it's very strange that such a senior figure should not know the current law, particularly when his job is enforcing those laws. Perhaps a little question to answer right now is, who are we? There is a little team. Um, Johan and I seem to be doing the leading. He talks to people, I read the papers, and we discuss the contents. He also keeps in touch with many people up and down the coast, particularly those involved with fishing and other activities on the coast. We go to meetings together, we attend conferences, and we study the Tara trawlers closely. I said earlier that the Tara trawlers are protected by the state. I also am of the opinion that the state is quite happy to bend the law to facilitate this industry. It is excessively dangerous for any state to do this because the state is supposed to be employed by the people of that country, not by a major corporation. In the case of Fukushima, the world and indeed the people of Japan are paying massively for this. A little article from one of Norway's biggest national papers, it says that uh, essentially Leiv Grunnevet and several other people are directors in the Hausforschung Institute, the Norwegian state-run and owned marine research organization at the same time as holding down directorships of some of Norway's biggest seafood producers. That is, they sit on the committees overseeing the health of our seas at the same time causing the biggest problems in our sea. This is the man in control of Tarde Tolling at FMC, he worked for the Fiskeri Directorate as an enforcer for 12 years.
When Johan and I started this adventure, the first thing we did was we filmed the Tara trawlers in operation. Some were operating illegally. At the time, we worked closely with the Fiskeri Directoratet. When we were when we presented our information, and it was clear that our video and other information was correct, there was a prosecution. Well, as far as we understood it, there was. After two years, we sought permission to follow this up, and uh, it was given. During that two-year period, we had been visited twice by the police, each of us separately. No coercion, just uh, friendly questioning. Did we see what we saw? This is the result of our questioning of the police. Here the policeman explains he has spoken to the chief of FMC. When we sent this in to the Fiskeri Directorate, the case went through in less than two weeks. <laughs> Around the beginning of 2016, we began to get information from people up and down the coast that the Tara trawlers were operating illegally in illegal zones at night. So we filmed one for over an hour and contacted the Fiskeri Director Artet. They told us yep. that there were no trawlers in the area, that all of them were in the harbour according to the tracking. We found out that any tracking is easy enough to manipulate. Here is an article on it. The trawler was breaking a number of laws, including a very major one, operating without navigation lights. During our surveillance, the trawler was passed by a large ship. We found out the name and we found out its details. According to our source, the fishing boat is called Jökul and here is a picture of her and the details to follow. There were other people who we have contact with who actually did manage prosecutions, um, but they had a massive fight, a really big fight with corporate lawyers and all kinds coming out of the woodwork. We noticed that the Tara trawlers had uh, white painted numerals on the side, the same as loading marks on ordinary ships, that they were way underwater when the Tara trawlers came in loaded. So we reported them to the state organization, the maritime agency called Schiffartsdirektoratet. Apparently, a prosecution happened almost at once. We noticed that all the Tara trawlers then seemed to have much smaller loads. So we uh, contacted them again, and apparently FMC company had been for a visit. Um, all of a sudden, the details, the geographic details and everything in our films were no longer visible. Um, they were not good enough. <laughs> okay. But first, a little bit of the history of the company involved with this. FMC Health and Nutrition is one of nine companies in FMC Corporation. FMC Corporation is one of America's biggest producers of chemical products. When I first became involved, it was called FMC Biopolymer. Now it is called FMC Health and Nutrition. Knowledge of the product, the way it is produced and the environmental effect would make this a laughable statement. FMC companies have received world record fines for nearly every corporate crime that there is. 
from polluting the land to polluting the air, from producing chemicals which kill wild animals on a massive scale, to permanently altering the most fragile ecosystem or the greater part of the most fragile ecosystem in the world. And this corporation, Norway, entrusts with its nature, its fragile nature. The first document I found was from EHS in Northern Ireland. It seemed a very sensible document. Um, it was written from the point of view of the harvesters, not from the point of view of conservation or environmentalists. I got in contact with the author and she assured me that um, she had an extremely dispassionate view on this. One uh, interesting fact emerged and that was that uh, mechanical harvesting they felt was completely unsustainable and would never be allowed. Talking with other researchers and indeed people involved with harvesting, it appears that this document is a major document. Everybody refers to it. The Tara Trolling Conference at Trondheim has already been mentioned. Here is Torjan Budwin, uh, a senior member of the Haasforsching Institute, telling a representative of Algea, another Norwegian seaweed harvesting firm, who clips the seaweed, doesn't trawl it, that their lack of research could possibly have large consequences for the ecosystem. Det påvirker jo i veldig sterk grad, det er jo veldig langsomt voksende art, kristangen, og det påvirker jo i veldig sterk grad det tredimensionale miljøet. Here is Terian Budin actually saying that um, it is now time to do serious research into the ecological consequences of tarde trawling, that is seaweed trawling. And the video is dated 2014, so this is actually taken two years after he told uh, the representative of Algier off for not doing enough research. Projektet, speciellt det i Norrland, det är helt i starten. Och arbetet i år, det går på att ha en utgångspunkt för alla våra senare undersökelser. Så ska vi följa dessa områden för hoppningsvis i 5, 6, 7, 8 år för att se är det någon effekt och i tillfälle hur lång tid vill den effekten vara i tarskogen. We asked him for his research results. They were not forthcoming. This is the front page of the first part of Budwin's project on seaweed trawling in the north. It is also interesting to see the other names on this report, Steen and Budwin in particular. This is most interesting because we have in our possession many documents from many different research institutions, Norwegian research institutions, which say that uh, the effects of tar trawling are extremely detrimental on the environment and the wildlife, and uh, in fact all the research has been done. This is Henning Steen, another uh, researcher from the Haas Forsching Institute, talking about sea urchin predation. He got quite upset when I suggested there could be a possible link between sea urchin predation and seaweed trawling. This is strange because we have a number of papers which say that if you remove the seaweed, the sea urchins move in. This says that the seaweed covers nearly 6,000 square kilometers and that sea urchin predation has destroyed nearly 2,000 square kilometers or 20 million tons of seaweed. It also says it is growing back. This actually is really quite exciting because there is massive harvesting activity in the area which for 40 years has been virtually destroyed by sea urchin predation. This uh, little snip seems to confirm that there is a link between seaweed trawling and sea urchin predation, but then I am no expert. I only read the paper. 
This is an amusing little snip. It says that Oslo Fjord, Fjord has a massive problem with sea urchins and that it's man-made. Here is an article which quotes the leader of FMC as saying that we are now going to harvest further north because the sea urchin predation has slackened and we see there is a good growth of seaweed plants. Here it says if we can re-establish the seaweed forest along the north coast of Norway it will bind up to 65 million tons of CO2. Here FMC says that the importance uh, of seaweed harvesting is the jobs. It brings lots of money into communities and makes lots of jobs. This is quite an interesting little paper. It says that if the area which is currently being trawled in North Norway had seaweed on it for the last 40 years, it would have bound over 150 million tonnes of CO2. That is not an insignificant amount. Now, as they are trawling in the same area, and we know that sea urchin predation can be brought on by um, seaweed trawling, there seems to be a possible conflict. First of all, I find this extremely disturbing. And secondly, if this is true, then it is incomprehensible that the Norwegian state allows this to happen. Totally incomprehensible. There are, however, quite a number of cracks in the armour. This is the front page of a document listing over 97 bird reserves in the counties named where tardar trawling is allowed in the bird reserves. This is a part of the long list naming the bird reserves. And <clears throat> this last little snip is a warning saying that they believe that the birds can be affected by tardar trawling, that there is not enough food for the birds after the trawling has been done. The document is dated 2005, so the birds' effect on birds was known a long time ago. So let's be clear, this is a official document detailing that birds may have problems with food if tardar trawling is allowed in the areas where they have reserves and it still allows it to go ahead. At Runde, Sven Håkon Luritsen presented a paper on seabirds and the effect that tardar trawling has on them. His paper clearly demonstrated that there is simply not enough food in the sea for many seabirds after harvesting. A really massive row started at the conference with FMC calling the paper unscientific and more. They were clearly frightened. I wonder why. This bird came into the harbour at Hustavika. Quite clearly it was very ill. Um, it didn't respond to any uh, noise, anything at all, and within a few hours, this is what we found. The changes in the dynamics of the local seabird population are quite marked and profound. Yeah, thank you. You don't often see these. What a beautiful bird. He weighs the question perhaps is, nothing. what is our wildlife worth? I don't think you can put a value on it. Frankly, I think it is worth far more than money. This is a Google result for Norwegian seabirds disappearing. Thousands of articles. Thousands. This article from 2006 talks about the seabirds disappearing and that it's lack of food. Here is Luritsen's article again. It says essentially that the small fish in the seaweed forest after trawling are reduced by over 90% and in a year's time there's only 85% of what is normally there. This is simply not survivable. I like my seabirds. I know many of the seagulls here very well indeed. At the moment they've all gone. There's not a single adult seagull in the area, only immature ones. This is again down to food. A great deal of the information presented here is taken from scientific documents. One thing that is clear about many of these documents is that there's a great deal of information lacking. 
the scientists perhaps have had not time or maybe their briefs have not extended into that particular area. One of the most interesting and potentially most uh, serious is the effects that the poisons which the plants have as chemical defences against predators, uh, the effects that they have on the nature surrounding them. We know that some land plants, plants in particular acacia, uh, is capable of producing massive amounts of toxins in an incredibly short time. It is quite clear that seaweed is not unusual in this either. Because of the way the seaweed is harvested in sections, it is possible that each area, when it is harvested, starts producing the toxins as a defence against this predator, and those Toxins are then spread to other areas which then trigger off the defences there. The result would be a massive reduction in life along the entire coast in all the seaweed forests. Is this what we are seeing? Is this what's happening? It is possible that the ultimate defence of the seaweed plants is not to grow back. A kind of collective suicide and in fact it makes a great deal of sense. If it doesn't grow back the predators have nothing to eat and they die off. Then the plants can grow back. It is interesting to note that the leaves of the seaweed plants are almost completely bare. They would normally be covered with the chalky tubes of marine worms and other animals. Our reading of the production of alginate indicates that too much calcium in the mix can seriously affect the production of alginate and the quality. We wonder if this may be a factor. What happens to the plants after harvesting is most interesting. They begin to rot almost instantly and that rot produces a gas called hydrogen sulphide. Hydrogen sulphide has been l mentioned as being as poisonous as cyanide gas. To prevent it from being a problem, the seaweed companies have to use formalin to control the bacteria, otherwise it produces too much gas and everybody nearby dies. This little article says that in 2000 FMC was releasing 700 tonnes of formalin into the sea per year, but they've now got much better and it's down to 100 tonnes. This is self-reported, there is nobody checking up on this. So we have to trust FMC on that. I wonder if we should. This is from the EU. It says that formalin should not be used in any food products whatsoever after 2015. This is the Wikipedia article on formalin. The first part says that if you ingest it, it will severely damage your upper digestive tract. And if you drink a 30 ml solution of 30% formalin, it will kill you. Long exposure can also give you cancer among many other problems. It is a very dangerous and very nasty substance. There is some literature which casts doubt on the health of uh, using alginates, but here is one on a sister product called carrageenan, which definitely does have very adverse health effects. It is interesting to note that FMC also pro produces and makes carrageenan. When doing this kind of work, it is important to leave no stone unturned. Seaweed trawling is not very unlike bottom trawling. The only difference is there is very little research on the effects of seaweed trawling. If you have ever pulled a seaweed plant up, you will notice that there's a great deal of sediment in the water afterwards. The seaweed forest is thick with sediment. It stops massive amounts of sediments in the sea dead and it drops to the bottom where bacteria and other factors slowly degrade it so it becomes harmless. Seaweed trawling disturbs those sediments. Those sediments are then brought up into the food chain where they are eaten by plankton who in turn are eaten by fish and we consume them. Anyone wondered where all the cancers we get come from? Well, there are many sources, but this is probably, in fact, very likely one of them. FMC, the company doing this seaweed trawling, has quite a bit to say about the environmental effects. 
This is a document produced by FMC. It says that seaweed trawling is sustainable. Same again, seabirds, no negative effects. And as they don't eat the seaweed, it's not a problem. Sea urchin predation, yes, we are harvesting in areas which have been heavily predated before, but they're not now, so that's okay. Wave damping, very little effect. Seaweed really doesn't produce much. For the industry to have started, there must have been some research done. And this is a quote from the research. It says, there have been no negative or irreversible consequences from seaweed trawling. This is a paper by a gentleman called Mork. Essentially, it says that there is significant wave damping effect from seaweed, in particular Laminaria hyperborea. This is a major report from the Irish government. It has some interesting things to say about the Norwegian harvest. First, there are significant changes after seaweed trawling. Secondly, many of the Norwegian reports are biased in favour of the industry. And thirdly, repeated trawling leads to a complete desert on the seafloor permanently. For many, this is not a question about who is right or who is wrong. It's a question of who you would like to believe. When you read a scientific paper, the reputation and indeed the currency of the author is at stake. If he lies, the whole industry knows that he lies. This is a list from Norway's Food and Health Organization, state-run organization. It's a list of places where you shouldn't eat any seafood from at all. That is a mighty long list and seems to cover most of the coast. Um, it is possible that uh, Little of this pollution is seaweed-related, but surely, if so much of the coast is heavily polluted, they should take every care. Seaweed removes every kind of pollutant and far faster than terrestrial plants, something like a factor by a factor of five. So, to sum up, FMC Company is busy removing the major factor in cleaning the seas with the help of the Norwegian government. One of the major infect effects of increase in pollutants in the sea is harmful algal blooms. Some of these algal blooms produce highly toxic poisons. And yes, America is having massive problems with it. Norway has. When it becomes airborne, people get ill. As the sea is poisoned, it also kills any fish in the sea, and that includes fish on fish farms. Sometimes when you're researching, you see something which suddenly rings a bell. This is about uh, sea lions, dolphins and killer whales in captivity dying because of the wrong type of herring, the wrong type of fish they were being fed, among other interesting effects. This article talks about several thousand dolphins and over 1,500 uh, pelicans being found dead in Peru. Could a change in the ecology of the surrounding area change the habits of the fish which were eating in the seaweed forest so they no longer go there, uh, leading to a massive increase in thiaminase in their bodies? We contacted one of the world's leading experts on whales about this issue. His reply was quite interesting. It said... If you find out any more, please, please let me know. This sounds really exciting. One of the birds in the film earlier is actually showing some of the symptoms which Leonard Bulk describes in the paper he wrote on thiamine deficiency in birds in the West. This is a little record of FMC's activity <coughs> in that part of the world. We also note that Peru banned any form of seaweed harvesting in 2008. It is clear that the results of seaweed trawling in this way are well known to the staff of the seaweed trawling company. They feel very much under threat and as a result they have threatened us on several occasions. We have also been told of threats by official organizations. I hope that this film has produced evidence which will convince most people of the danger and the harm that this industry is doing not only in Norway but worldwide. The fact is that it's under the sea, it's hidden, people don't see it, it needs to stop before major, major events occur and they will if it doesn't. <laughs>